Kia ora, Tulofa, Namaste. Hi to my, big it up to yourself, love yourself, love Aotearoa. <clears throat> Glorious day here in Aotearoa. We love Aotearoa, we love Aotearoa sport. And we are from the Niche Cache, otherwise known as the Niche Cache, the niche cache.com. We are always whipping up Aotearoa sporting yarns and insights and information wildcard fresh out of the oven a little bit of sourdough bread marco staminich bit of champions league footy wild card first of all i thought he was going to miss champions league footy and now he's behind you singing the imaginary champions league am anthem like apparently that is a significant bit of uh music but can you just explain why he's like that little drama of him not being there, them being available, and just what you uh, – any observations from your time this morning watching Marco Staminich, a Kiwi from Aotearoa, playing Champions League footy? Yeah, the um, big old stitch-up was what that was with the squad thing because I swear I'm the only person in New Zealand who actually looked it up and noticed that he wasn't on their squad list initially. Um, and then – like a day later, he was in the squad list. And I don't know exactly, because he doesn't, he didn't seem to make the cut for the A list. There's like the A list and the B list. The B list is sort of for um, younger players. And I didn't, I couldn't figure out how he was eligible for the B list. Um, but that's what happened is he ended up getting added to that. And he definitely wasn't in the squad to start with, because I saw it on multiple things and none of them had him there. But then like 24 hours later, he was added to it. And I think that's because you can update the B list. Um, as you go along, like from game to game, you can add other young players to the thing. You can only have like, uh, actually, I, I don't know. I don't know if there is a limit. I, I was thinking there's maybe something like eight players in a squad max, but you can change that from week to from game to game. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I still don't, I haven't figured out exactly how he's eligible for the big list given he was out on loan last season. Um, and has only been there for two years in general since he signed with the club. Seemed like he was a year short of eligibility. That's not the case. I'm certainly not going to argue with it. <laughs> I'd rather take that um, take that L and have him playing Champions League footy. <laughs> Definitely the, the preferred um, option there. So however it went, he cracked into their Champions League squad and then kind of shockingly, given he hadn't started a game um, at all this season up until like Monday morning, I think it was, we played in a 2-1 uh, Superliga loss back in the domestic stuff. Chucked into start at home against Sevilla in the Champions League, like against a team that's got like, um, you know, even Rakitic was playing for them. He's probably the star player at the moment. Um, like That's who he's going like head to head up against in that midfield. Uh, it, was, it was beautiful to see. It was a lovely surprise. Uh, it did didn't expect i mean i thought he'd be on the bench and i was hoping he might come on late on in the in the match or something like that like maybe if it's um the one nil up or if it's still nil all or something chuck him on as a second defensive midfielder actually he started as a second defensive midfielder but because they had two cdms he sort of had a bit more freedom to push forward especially in the second half when um well i'd say no not even then i'd say late in the first half he started making like late runs into the penalty area trying to get on the end of crosses and stuff and using his height it was it was, a, it was a fun performance from him because he wasn't overawed. Like he, at one point he tried to do a little dummy thing where he'd like drop a shoulder, let the ball roll past into the next guy. It got intercepted, but still um, like he's trying things like that. It was a chip pass as well. When he got closed down, he's like, I'm not going to panic. I'm just going to dink it over the top of this guy trying to, trying to tackle me. Like things like that, where you just see the confidence of the dude. It's it beautiful. Also, he gave away like six fouls and picked up a yellow card. It was the theme of the game was Copenhagen were breaking things up regularly, and he was definitely part of that. So I couldn't say he had a flawless game or anything like that. Certainly not. Like a couple sprayed passes he shouldn't have, but like way more interested in seeing the confidence of the dude on the big stage and just the fact that he's there at all because it has been... 15 years since the last uh, Kiwi male played in the in the Champions League proper, like not including qualifying the actual group stage onwards, 15 years. Um, and he's only the fifth all time to do so. So pretty significant playing Kiwis, Kiwi football uh, morning there. The, the stats I'm looking for from a football midfielder is like 95% passing accuracy. 
he was at 70 percent. so like i say missed a few passes that he should have that's all right that's all right it's champions league debut it's all right yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting my bar high like i'm this is what i'm of course this is what i want 95 percent passing and 10 fouls so i'm like marco staminich 70 percent passing six fouls you're almost hitting my benchmark so that's impressive from marco staminich big fan of the kiwi footballer racking up the fouls it's like chris wood with the most offsides like these yeah. are Stephen adams winning the most uh tip-offs jump balls like these are important kiwi sporting stats and then in a more condensed fashion football it's all about the fouls so big up the also marco siufatu nicholas damanich according to wikipedia so he is in the champions league you mentioned some of the guys he was playing against Libby Kakache wasn't playing against uh, the bro, Totti, was he? Uh, no, nah, a couple years too late for that one. But he was he was playing against a team coached by Jose Mourinho. So there's mm. there's that. A little bit of kerfuffle at the end of the game, actually, where Libby gets fouled by a dude running down the sideline in front of like the coach's technical areas. And then the dude who fouled him stayed down injured afterwards. It was like, and he got yellow carded because it was a bad foul. He like just chopped him down as, as Kakache was trying to break. And then Kakache goes over and is just like, bro, get up. And then another teammate comes in. So Libby pushes him out of the way. That guy pushes him back. Everyone comes running in. Jose Mourinho comes running all the way up to the sideline and starts talking to the guy who's lying on the ground, probably saying, just stay, bro, stay down, bro. Just stay down. Like waste some more time. Um, and then, yeah, the dude tries to stand up and the Kikache grabs around the hips and goes to pick him up. Another guy pushes him off again and he's just like, what? What did I do? I'm trying to get on with the game here. But close and up close and personal with the, the mind games right in front of Jose Mourinho, I got I to gotta believe that Jose respected that for sure. I'm sure Francisco Totti respects Aotearoa football as well. Big fan of Totti from the uh, 2000s to 2010 range. But a fee, yeah, a bit great of Euros. player. Great player. Fantastic. We are the Niche Cache, and we, earlier this week we recorded a uh, Patreon podcast for the Patreon Fano. Patreon is the best way to support the Niche Cache directly, straight up the guts. And we basically went in depth, breaking down the Black Cap stuff and reflecting on their whole situation. So if you do want to hear us do a good old 40 minutes about Black Caps cricket, that is on the Patreon feed right now. It will cost you maybe a dollar a month. So if you really want to, you can just sign up and then leave. If you just want to listen to that podcast, I don't know how that works, but I probably shouldn't recommend that, but it's a, it's up to you. It's however generous you want to be sign up and, uh, the Patreon fund supports us every month. It can be just a dollar a month, whatever you're able to provide to share, or you can do more up to you. Patreon.com forward slash our niche case. And there's an extra cricketing podcast there every week at the moment which gets a bit funkier heading into summer wildcard. A lot of cricket coming up, especially the domestic cricket realm. We're going to talk about National League football. <clears throat> and that's quite a fun little pocket of Aotearoa sport. I'm getting a very similar buzz from just pondering domestic cricket men's and women's and some of the, the players that you get to see and just following all that stuff closely. It's a beacon of summertime. And we're approaching it so looking forward to that and also tomorrow's a friday so every monday and friday we serve up our email newsletter via substack the nichecache.substack.com all sorts of niche cache content is found there the links to our website and the big yarns that we're doing i'll do a white fern series preview done a kiwi nrl finals preview wildcard's got a women's national league preview as well as flying kiwis that's all there live and those links will be part of the email news that we send out tomorrow night friday night as well as all the podcast information and extra yarn extra cordial i'll probably go a bit deeper into the round of rugby league under 21 finals in queensland and new south wales reserve grade finals nrl women's footy is rolling on so i'll be diving into that maybe even some uh, local rugby league as well any cricketing notes i am pondering neil wagner's extra avant-gardeness what's what's extra avant-gardeness wildcard um avant-avant-garde i don't know <laughs> 
It's avant garde deluxe. Yeah, there you go. I think I think I will uh, do a couple paragraphs about Neil Wagner and whatever the fuck he's doing because I find him fascinating. Um, but that's just some of the stuff you might find in our email newsletter. Niche case content as well as extra corridor about Aotearoa sport every Monday and Friday evening. Start our podcast wildcard with a dose of mindfulness. Postman Pat, please deliver it. Yeah. Um, this is, I, I, I'm not sure the mindfulness is in the quote itself so much as the context of the quote, but this is a thing from Jack Kerouac's book, The Dharma Bums, which you ask me, I think is a superior novel to um, On the Road. I certainly preferred that one. Um, and he's talking about drinking tea. And he says, the first sip is joy. The second is gladness. The third is serenity. The fourth is madness. The fifth is ecstasy. I don't know exactly what he's getting at there, but I, A, I like the little poemy thing there. And then B, I also think he's, there's something to that idea of like, um, especially when it comes to drink, like a, a hot drink, it's the way people drink tea sort of things. And the way I literally like sipping on this tea here myself as I, as I go along every podcast, but something to like the ceremonial aspect of that, like just having that, because we're talking about mindfulness and being aware and present in the moment and things like that. This is also a thing about like, I don't know, the ritual of food and drink where it's like the way we drink, the way we eat, being aware of it in the moment and having that kind of ritual about it. I don't know, it's just, A, it's probably beneficial in some way, um, like physically. Like, and then also B, it's just like, it makes the experience so much more rewarding as well for yourself. Well, I don't know if you can think of some other aspect of that in which like food and drink, different, I mean, Drugs and alcohol are obviously a thing that has a lot of ritualistic aspects to it, and most of us have probably dabbled in at least a couple examples of that in the past. Um, that's a similar thing as well, I would say. Definitely, weed culture, I think, is definitely something that where it's like a lot of um, a lot of this kind of stuff. But even just like because there's, there's a thing called the Book of Tea. I think a guy called Ishiguro, I think, like a Japanese philosopher from about 150 years back, who wrote a thing about like japanese tea ceremonies which i've been meaning to read and get into that as well but that all of the same thing like all comes into the same thing of like the the ritualistic aspect of how we consume the stuff that we have to consume in order to survive it's kind of a um it puts it on a different level if you know what i mean kava kava for sure absolutely like it just, <clears throat> just seems like a such a um prime example of what you're discussing the other thing that came yeah, to definitely. mind was uh breaking bread yep like just the saying breaking bread comes from a i'd say a very ancient time so and the importance of breaking bread with people as a way to share ideas and and come together <sighs> hungry sitting around a fire yeah preparing the even fire. just a humble barbecue you know it's, it's all similar there. things Glorious mindfulness wildcat. Beautiful. Let's crack into some Aotearoa sport. And we will start with some black caps here, wildcat, just fresh off the um what's been happening earlier this week. Uh with the Patreon podcast came out and, and, and highlighted some softness with the black caps. And just a few days removed, I just want to get your idea about this. A few days removed from it. And hearing some of the feedback and people reacting to uh, that yarn on the website. I want to double down on the idea that it's not about Australia. Because even you threw that idea at me on the variety show and I kind of talked around it. Um, I don't think it's any different to any other sport, really. We've got All Blacks versus Wallabies this weekend, Bledisloe Cup game. And... That's the only sport I can really think of where Australia isn't like just far superior than New Zealand on the, in the whole, like over our lifetimes, which is interesting because now the Wallabies are being thrown up as some massive test for the All Blacks, but they always kind of suck against the All Blacks. So that's uh, 
interesting here is what will happen this weekend. But if you're a Kiwis Rugby League fan, the relationship is with Australia is not good. Like we get smoked by Australia. Usually about seven times out of 10, we're losing. But you do get those couple of wins and those couple of wins are enough to keep you going. Um, there's not enough football between the two nations. Basketball, Australia is way better than Aotearoa basketball, but we're coming up. We've had a few moments, you know, in, in these sports. Cricket, women's cricket, Australia is far superior than the White Ferns. And at every level of cricket, I reckon Australia men are far superior than New Zealand men. All you need to think about is the prototypical bowl, prototypical seam bowler from each country. What do you think when I say prototypical Australian seam bowler wild card? Uh, 145 kilometers an hour, lots of bounce, and maybe a little bit of reverse swing. Pat Cummins. Yep. Right. So... <laughs> What do you what do you think of when I say prototypical New Zealand seam bowler? One hundred and thirty-two kilometers an hour, um, almost always right-handed, uh, hence a seam movement. Hmm. Is Tim Sally's probably a good example? The Australians love to in that series they were highlighting the Gavin Larson, um, <laughs> Chris Harris. Types. Why do people so, always think of Gavin Larson in those? Because that's the I think it's the era before. For us, it's Nathan Astle, yeah. Craig McMillan, that type of um, yeah. character in that role. Yeah, um, I guess yeah, it's, it's talking about the age of the people in that commentary box as much as anything. Correct. Um, the but that is to say, Australia has a type of cricket and a type of playing sport. New Zealand has a different style, and we've always like fair play to Australia. They are a superior sporting nation as much as we love our Aotearoa sport. Um. So I think, and we don't really play a lot of cricket against Australia. And usually we're losing. And that's okay. Australia's just better. You ask me if there's a mental block, and I, that's what I'm explaining. I don't think it's a mental block. I just think Australia is better than Aotearoa at a lot of sports. And that's not a mental block. It's just a difference in talent. Like the Black Sticks yeah. men don't have a mental block against the Australian team, the Kookaburras. The kookaburras are just way better. There's nothing mentally the black sticks men can do, right? Like Australia is just way better in some of these sports. So again, it is to say that I don't think that this is specifically about one day cricket or any cricket against Australia. The issue I'm seeing with the black caps is that softness from the test cricket stuff going back the series in India, there was some softness there apart from Ajaz Patel. Everyone else crumbled in that series in that second test. That flowed into losing to Bangladesh in Aotearoa. Yeah, they bounced back. But then that uh, developed and parlayed is the word I'm using, want to use. That was parlayed into, I think they won the first test against South Africa, then lost the, test here, uh, the second test against South Africa. Losing to Bangladesh in South Africa in Aotearoa, Oh, that's a bit niggly. And then all of that's parlayed into being swept by England, which is disgustingly niggly. The opposite of what I predicted would happen. So all of that is kind of compounded on top of each other to being swept by Australia. Like, you can't even win the dead rubber game, as the White Ferns have become very good at doing. You lose the series, but then you win the next game and it's a, it's slightly better. No, the Black Caps were swept by England in tests and then swept by Australia in ODIs. And that whole package is the issue. So how are you like reflecting on some of those ideas? Yeah, I like personally, I, I do think there is something of a mental block. I do think there is something of the Black Caps going up against Australia and just not believing they can win in the way, especially in Australia, not believing they can win in the way they might against other teams. Um, but is that different to any of these other New Zealand teams? Yeah, well, that's the thing. May, maybe not. Like, maybe that's like, is there a mental block? Sure. Is the mental block because of like, 
is the mental block the only reason they're struggling? Definitely not. And is the mental block only there because of the things that you highlighted? Yeah, potentially. Like it's, if, if they don't believe they can beat Australia in Australia um, and they don't play like that and they start playing with fear and stuff like that, it's like, yeah, you can, you can obviously see the ways in their performance in which they shouldn't be playing with fear. They shouldn't be trying to bat at 50% strike rate um, for the first 25 overs. And like, maybe you should try scoring some runs and take a few risks and back the fact that you've picked like a batting lineup that goes at least down to eight kind of thing. Like maybe, maybe you should be more confident in your abilities as cricketers because you're all good enough to be there sort of thing. But also it stems from the fact that probably none of them have won a game in Australia before <laughs> or very few of them have anyway. Like it's not, it's not something they're used to doing. Like you get confidence from repetitions and, and experience and very few New Zealand cricketers are used to beating Australia, um, used to going to Australia and not getting thrashed even. And a lot of them were, a lot of this group were in that team, that tour that played test matches there. And so late 2019, I think it was. And we got absolutely demolished there too. Like worse than it was in this ODI series, even because well, at least the, the ODI crossover. series, they were in the game for a while. Well, the crossover from the World Cup, like at Eden Park, we roll Australia, but then as soon yeah. as you go to Australia yeah. for the final, that's Aussie's time, and that's and that's their time to shine. Very contrasting performances, very contrasting results. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's maybe the best example of the difference as well, because we have actually been competitive against Australia in Aotearoa a few times at cricket, partly because. You know, they don't always send their strongest 11 to for an ODI series. Uh, Small playing at Sid and Park. And, and... Yeah. Like a few, this, yeah, <laughs> the comforts of home, <laughs> as you could say. But um, yeah, it's a, uh, the, the thing is you can, you can point at aspects of that ODI series and be like, they got this wrong. They got this wrong. They got this wrong. Um, or just like, I think a key factor was something we talked about in that Patreon podcast about like, just apart from Trent Bolt, which makes this extra funny because Trent Bolt doesn't have a contract and might not be available for games going forward. But apart from Trent Bolt, no one really stepped up and was like, I'm going to be the one to get, you know, man of the match today. I want that ceremonial bottle of wine and the massive check or whatever, um, I'm going to be the dude to lead my team to victory today. Like no one did that. Everyone wanted to be the supporting role and um, no one wanted to be like the head cook kind of thing. That That's maybe an, a, a worry of eh, leadership, but I, I don't like saying leadership because it makes it sound like I'm criticizing Kane Williamson as captain. And it's, it's not that like it, any successful team has a leadership group and has multiple players who will own big moments and things like that that's not something that falls back entirely on a on a captain or on a coach um that's a wider team cultural thing but yeah e even though there are those kind of things you can pinpoint it's also well every time they go to australia they get thrashed this is the uh like well, every time but you know more often than not they go to australia and they lose a lot of games that was what my stat was on the on the variety show was a, about a lot of that every time they go to england they don't lose three nil every time they play bangladesh at home they don't drop test matches like that's they do normally lose to india when they go over to india and they did actually get a nice commendable draw in the first test it was a pity how much less like how much they weren't able to repeat that in the second but apart from aj's patel's uh heroics but yeah like losing in australia par for the course losing lots of games recently in multiple formats in multiple different ways i mean i know their record of winning test series in england isn't good i think they've only done it twice um and one was when they went just before the World Test Championship final. But also, they don't normally get swept in the way that they did. So, it's that that's the issue. Like, the, the path of the course thing could wait. Like, yes, we probably need to be better at playing against Australia in Australia and be more confident and whatever, but that can wait. The bigger problem is the fact that they seem to have this sort of brittleness, the softness, as you, as you call it, like, they seem to be displaying this in a lot of series uh, recently. That that's the that's the pertinent factor. That's the thing that needs fixing. And the worry is, I don't, I don't really know how it happens because it's not like it's not like you 
drop Kane Williamson and you become a better team or you ch- stop him being captain and then Tom Latham becomes the captain. Well, Tom Latham's record is a lot worse than Kane Williamson's record in, as a captain in terms of like results recently. Part of that because Kane William for Tom Latham to be captain and Kane Williamson needs to not be playing. So again, like you drop Kane Williamson, you don't become a better team. <laughs> Latham's captaincy record might be part of proof to that. But yeah, I I don't know what the fix is other than something internal, like something about like we need to be more confident, we need to be more um, aggressive in, in things. We need to stop making these conservative decisions around selections and tactics and and just the way that we play our cricket in general, or at least at least get the balance back to where it was a couple of years ago. I, I don't really know what the what the fix is for that. Um, I can't I can't think of the easy thing because it's not like this. They've already brought Devin Conway into the team. You know, it's not like Devin Conway's just waiting for his eligibility, and it's like, well, as soon as he's ready, he'll be in there and he'll be fine. Um, but I do also think maybe there is an aspect of like. Conway's now been an international cricketer for what, like a year and a half or something. Um, maybe there's this is a little bit of like the first dips of the roller coaster in order to, as he sort of steadies himself at that level. I think maybe we've seen that a little bit from Lockie Ferguson. Maybe we've seen that a little bit from Carl Jamison in, in recent times. Um, a few of those guys are maybe, maybe there's something of that as well. And it's just a lot of stuff aligning at once. But yeah, I'm. I'm not really sure what the next step is other than the Black Caps just need to play better. <laughs> this might just be that simple. They just need to be better at performing at the cricketing activities. Thinking back over the timeline of this kind of idea, I think that Indian series might have been a key juncture because Kane Williamson plays the first test, doesn't play the second yeah. test. And like I think the Black Caps were rolled for less than a hundred in one of those innings, and that, as you said, it was kind of a gritty. This is what I like about Test cricket: as you can, or any sport, as you can enjoy a gritty draw. Like if you're in an, an, an adverse position, you know, fighting your way to a one-one draw with ten men in football, that's fun. Like. Because you're, yeah, you're not winning, but there is some sort of uh, joy to be found in that gritty draw. And I think a first test away to India and you're drawing that test, that's a pretty gritty result. And that's what you want to see. That's the only draw they have had in this World Test Championship cycle. And they've only had two wins. They've had plenty of losses. And one of those losses was the next test where Kane Williamson dips out of the team with the start of that elbow injury and there's no grittiness there's no ruggedness there's no sort of like cricketing backbone spine that you want to see and i think that might have been some sort of early sign where i don't know uh, we don't have solutions here uh we don't know what it is but just like maybe williamson's out so there's no confidence and um yeah we were already a conservative team under Kane Williamson. He's gone, so now we're going into our shells even further. Like no one's telling us, like now's your time to step up and go out and fucking grab that and do all that shit. Like that's not happening. So I think that might have been an interesting juncture, and it's kind of flowed on, seeped into some of their cricket moving forward. Yeah, bowled out for sixty-two um, in the mm. first innings to that second test. India scored three, two, five. Um, I go well, got 150 of that, and I think Tim Sally got it. No, this was the this was the AJS Patel test. That was the first what, one. What AJS Patel the, got all 10 wickets. What were the numbers um, from the first test, like totals? Um, let me check that first test. India scores three four five. New Zealand responds with two nine six. India two three four for seven declared. New Zealand 165 for nine. And then in the second test. India scores three two five. Black Caps sixty two all out. Um, sixty two all out in which Tom Latham scored ten. Carl Jamison got seventeen. They were the only ones in double figures. And Jamison's thirty six deliveries were the most anyone lasted. Ravi Ashwin got four for eight. Um, India responds with two seven six for seven declared, and the Black Caps are bowled out for one hundred and sixty seven. 
to lose by 372 runs, which is 372 runs is more than any team scored in any of those innings. <laughs> That's not a good sign. I just Daryl Mitchell a- did score 60 in this in the second innings. I just caught a whiff of uh, softness right there, wildcard, in that mm-hmm. second test against India as you read through some of those scores. Interesting, I'd like to juxtapose the Black Caps against the White Ferns. And I think over the past year, since the T20 World Cup final, we have, to this point, we have to adjust Black Caps' expectations. Like, I think we're going to learn more about the Black Caps in this upcoming T20 World Cup. It's a nice me- nice measuring stick against the last World Cup, roughly a year on. So we can kind of get a definitive gauge of where the Black Caps are at. But I do not believe the Black Caps are a world-class elite cricketing unit right now. Like, they're not top two. They're not top three. They're you know, maybe top five, but they're not competing for championships right now, I don't think. They definitely aren't competing for a World Test Championship final as they were in the previous cycle. So that tells the story right there. So we're just kind of figuring out Black Caps' expectations or more so how good are the Black Caps in relation to the world of cricket. I think they have not a big dip, but there's definitely been some sort of dip. And I think the White Ferns coming off their Commonwealth Games success where they won a bronze medal... They've had a a little spike. And while we're trying to figure out this Black Caps thing, we don't know what it is, but there's something there. Um, Another note to that, we like, like, all the players are cool. It's like, uh, we don't really have issues with the coaching. Yeah, there's some style elements, but these are some really talented cricketers, but there's just something with the team, and we can't figure that out. We're trying to learn about it and grow with it. White Ferns, on the other hand, ahead of their tour of the West Indies, we know what we're dealing with, and we know what they want to do. Like, well, I've been the first person to highlight uh, wonky White Ferns business. Right now, there is at least like a clear direction they're heading in. They've got a young squad. They've got three genuinely world-cast players, Sophie Devine, Susie Bates, and Amelia Kerr. Probably they're the top three batters, like literally first, second, and third. And if you know that every game the White Ferns are playing, those players are going to be batting one, two, and three, and they're in the team, two of them are bowling, and you've got a cast of younger role players around them, I can at least see a plan. I can see a direction moving forward, and I'm curious how that looks against a fairly even Stevens west indies team the west indies weren't at the commonwealth games because some of those caribbean nations weren't colonized so they weren't in the in the commonwealth games also west indies isn't a country so they would have had to play for like jamaica or bahamas or whatever there were, were some of the islands yeah that's what i'm saying so her majesty or her majesty, his, his majesty now his majesty or whoever it was back then it was her then yeah didn't colonize the territory of the west indies mm. in fact they probably did some disgusting things in that region specifically um but that is to say the west indies did not go to the commonwealth games barbados went to the commonwealth games and now the white ferns are playing the west indies so that was the only change from the World Cup. Cricket being a uh, colonizer sport, all the teams from the World Cup are playing in the Commonwealth Games, except the West Indies were Barbados. So now we should assume that West Indies are better than Barbados because there's more players available. Um, but I think it's two fairly even teams, and we're going to learn some more about this White Ferns team coming up in, a, in ODIs and T20s against West Indies, starting with ODIs, first ODI Saturday morning. Sweet. That's, what's, the, what's the squad look like compared to the Com games? Because... Um... I guess one other aspect of the Commonwealth Games compared to the World Cup is the Com Games was T20, wasn't it? And ODI World Cup was the one where the White Ferns kind of hit the wall. Um, they've lost a lot of games. 
didn't look fantastic, but their 2020 form has in general been better than their ODI form anyway, like going back a few years. And Sophie Devine is as good a 2020 player as there is on the planet. Um, like that, that helps that, 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 that does aid things, but how, yeah. How does the squad look compared to that? Are we, cause the, there were a couple of changes. Well, first of all, there was a couple of retirements after the world cup. Um, some semi-enforced i don't necessarily like the thing about amy satterthwaite it being enforced into retire. she didn't have to retire she could like her own wife is in the team still playing without a contract she could have kept playing but she chose not to that's fair enough um but there have been a couple of retirements and a couple of players who have been maybe moved on a few younger ones coming through and we saw that a bit in the com games is it the same kind of balance going into this uh wendy's tour well a little more experience because Jessica right. and Lauren Down come into the equation. They, they are a little bit older, a little bit more experienced. Um, and were injured at the Com Games there. Yeah, Lauren Down, third mental health break of the past 18 months for right. women's cricket is another great sign of uh, the support systems there. Um, Molly Penfold is also in this squad. She's a hostile seamer fairly similar to Ben Sears as far as like just unique athletes who bowl fast, which as we alluded to earlier, Aotearoa doesn't have a lot of. But the thing I'm pondering the most ahead of doing my preview tomorrow is West Indian conditions, not hard and fast. So like the White Ferns have Leah Tahuhu, Hannah Rowe, Molly Penfall, Jess Kerr, Haley Jensen's quite a nifty little seamer as well. And obviously Sophie Devine has handy mediums. It's a bit of a seam heavy pace attack for the White Ferns, but in the Caribbean, a lot of changes of pace are going to be effective and spin bowling. And there's certainly a... the case when the Black Caps were there, wasn't it? Spin bowling exactly. was excellent. And Amelia Kerr, world-class leggy. Fran Jonas is developing nicely. And of, and uh, Eden Carson's also on the team. I don't know if all three of them are going to play too often together. But um, Jonas has shown that she's a very accurate, subtle bowler. And that's quite effective against a lot of uh, female batters around the world. And we've talked a lot about Eden Carson's upside as a fielder one of the best throwing arms in the White Ferns, which is pretty impressive for a new player. And she's a bit flatter with her offspin, uh, a bit quicker, I think. And how effective they can be is going to be crucial for the White Ferns moving forward because Amelia Kerr will want to bowl as much as possible. But I think if you can kind of manage her workload by having really effective spinners around her or wicket-taking options so you're not relying on Amelia Kerr to be a, a gun leg spinner. I think that's how the White Ferns build moving forward. Let's get into some football here, Wildcard. And you whipped up a uh, Women's National League preview. And there's a lot of uh, fantastic Aotearoa football things happening right now. Football Ferns just played some games. All Whites, uh, they've got a little series against Australia coming up. Kiwis are balling out all over the globe. An amazing time to be a Kiwi football fan. Let's just sharpen the focus, Walker. Get the binoculars out, give the little lens a twist, and let's zone in on Aotearoa, though, because domestic football is arriving. And as someone on the outside of football, but coming from like a, like, I'm really excited about some of the, you know, you get under 18s New Zealand rugby league teams, under 16 residence teams. And these kind of teams are announced. These kind of games come at this time of year, national premierships and all that stuff. That is where you see the next up athletes. And especially for football, like these players all kind of, like, there's not many young players from Aotearoa who are signed to a European club when they're 17, right? That uh -huh. pathway is very different to the NRL, for example. It's more 
spend a year in the National League or come up and play a couple seasons in the National League, then you're getting some obscure professional gig. And then you're getting some slightly less obscure professional gig. And then you're getting a seriously legit professional gig. You kind of work your way up that path. And that is to say that the National League for men's and women's football, you're going to find some uh, glorious battlers, some, you know, some... 15 fouls per game type of Kiwi footballers, slightly older, and that's part of the development ground. But you're also going to see the guys who are going professional in a couple of years, and especially all these women's female opportunities are opening up. So whether it's women's domestic cricket in New Zealand and getting familiar with those players because they are going to be the next White Ferns, same applies for football in the National League football. These players are going to be the next football ferns and there's across all these sports, there's a truckload of them coming through. So I'm curious just to set up some of the National League stuff, men's and women's. Women's starts this weekend, men's starts in a few weeks time. Drop some names of players that you have been learning about that you think in your research are going to be folks we should get familiar with moving forward probably start with the female side yeah well i mean um the <laughs> if, if you look at the canterbury united uh pride team that's been named there's a pretty handy uh young emerging player named Alyssa winham who was on that squad list which was a little bit of a surprise given that preseason probably starts <laughs> a couple of weeks as well for the um the wellington phoenix but i guess maybe she can squeeze in a couple of games for Canterbury in between. She's on the list. I, I'm curious how that's going to look because, um, you know, you, yeah, the, the, the balance of, um, the balance of the way in which player development and like the high level has worked in the women's side of football in the last 12 months has changed pretty significantly by the emergence of the Wellington Phoenix one of the funny things about the Wellington Phoenix is they actually didn't sign anyone from Wellington last year. <laughs> um, despite it all, they, did, they didn't actually sign a Wellington. They had a couple of players from like, um, you know, the central region, the three or four Cantabrians. They had a few Aucklanders, um, one or two that are, you know, live in Australia and have been there for the last few years. Like no Wellingtonians, surprisingly. Um, maybe there's still time for that to change. I think they've got a couple more Kiwi spots. It's been expanded for this upcoming season. But it's not just the Phoenix as well, because the Phoenix sort of came in to operate in the space that the, well, the space above where the Future Ferns development program was was operating. But the thing with the Future Ferns development program is it was based in Auckland and um, playing, you know, sporadic games against, I think, boys under 15 teams and things like that. And a lot of like training, trying to simulate a professional experience. And they did good work in that program as well of getting players professional gigs overseas um but then the wellington phoenix happened and kind of off cut that the coaching staff of Gemma lewis and natalie lawrence goes from the ffdp to the wellington phoenix specifically a bunch of players who were in the ffdp signed for the wellington phoenix um i don't see too many other phoenix players doing what Alyssa winham's doing and playing a few games but i am pretty i'm i'm hopeful that we'll see some more of the um what was called the FFDP, sometimes also the A-League off-season program. I'm not sure if those are exactly the same things or if they're definitely related at least. Because um, some of those players didn't play a lot for their Windsor clubs. And they are, because they're based in Auckland, they will be aligned more likely with the Auckland clubs. So I'm hopeful, and Auckland clubs obviously aren't doing like squad names or anything coming up before the thing because they've been playing with the same squad for the whole winter season they don't need to name a squad they've already got a squad but hopefully we do see a few of those types of players or anyone who misses out on a phoenix contract as well um popping up in the in the domestic stuff not necessarily yeah don't really like know how that will go yet until i actually see games and lineups and see who who appears suddenly um but hopefully that we'll get a bit of that even still like all the regions have exciting young players. So every region is going to have players who have played age grade internationals in the last few years. Um, like, well, I don't have to look at the squad list to go through everyone, but even like 
in the in the Kate Shepherd Cup final on the weekend. You had Auckland United against Northern Rovers. Both teams will be part of the National League. Like Auckland United with, you know, Millie Clegg and Ruby Nathan were both at the under 20 World Cup. Um the that um that uh what do you call him? So, well, no, I was just talking like um like 17 year old goalkeeper as well that they had there um amy feinberg daniele you look at the other team rovers they had like i think suya herring's pretty close to like under 17s they had a alexis cook up front about 17 years old like um danny canham in the midfield as well like all these teams are going to have players who and the women's competition skews younger anyway so you're more likely to get players 17 18 19 playing a lot of games um but every single team is going to have three, four, five players who are going to be in that kind of thing, or it's like eligible for the next under twenties wave or something like that, or, or whatever, or even like trying to put their hands up for, for Phoenix contention or because there is, there are a couple more professional spots that the Phoenix can fill. There are also, I think four scholarship roles that they can fill and scholarship players have to be under a certain age. And I, don't think they're allowed to have had a previous professional contract. So the players who miss out on full contracts who were there last year for the Knicks can't just drop into scholarship deals. Um, the Knicks do have their own academy. And I wonder if a few of the players there won't feature in National League because they're focusing on Phoenix Academy things now that they've got a, you know, a, a women's section to that as well. Um, but that would also seem to suggest that those players are highly likely to get those scholarship deals for the for the senior team. So um, basically, like every game that you watch, if you watch any one of these women's uh, premiership games or National League as it is now, any one of these women's National League games, whether you know it or not, you're probably watching a future international player. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the lay of the land there. Who would you have as your like must see player in the women's competition? Um, like someone who either you yourself you're like I need to see this player play as much as possible because I have high hopes for them. And for the listener, the local football fan, this player is playing for this team. So when they're in your town, make sure you go out and check like some low key kind of future star. Um, yeah, I, top of the list, probably, I think like Millie Clegg has potential to be a, a, a superstar. Like she's this kind of player who, who's only like 16 or 17 now as it, like right now as it stands and she's already won a Kate Shepard cup final, scored a goal at a under 20 world cup, um, where she was the youngest player in the squad, started all three games, even still like an actual genuine striker, great finisher good movement, good balance, good athleticism, good touch, like the the kind of package of a player that we don't really develop, like an actual proper number nine player, especially that's exactly what the football ferns, if she was six years older, she'd start every single football ferns game. Like she's not quite there yet. She's still very young, but she's definitely, Millie Clegg is absolutely someone who's high on that list. Um, I, I could go through the squads as they've been named so far and pick out players, but maybe that might take a bit long. So, uh, Millie Clegg just wins fine. And if you can catch Canterbury United playing early over the next few weekends, yeah. you're going to see Alyssa Wynnum, Wellington Phoenix player, playing local footy in Aotearoa, which is really fun for Kiwi fans as well. On the I haven't side, I haven't checked the thing, but I assume they've got a home game in the first couple. Because that's the best part of it is she's a Christchurch native, will be playing for a Christchurch team in Christchurch at some point. Like that's kind of perfect little homecoming. Be if like Joseph Tarpane was playing for the Wellington Orcas. Yeah, like a couple Wellington. games before NRL preseason or yeah. something, you know, or um, maybe he will. Just to help set up some of the men's stuff, who is the best player? The best young men's player in Aotearoa right now. Um, I don't know. I might have to wait to answer that because I might have to actually like see who's playing and who's set up. But I mean, Finn Sermon's captaining the under 19s at the Oceania Champs right now. He's the one like fully professional player in that squad. I 
do have big raps on him. I don't necessarily know if, if I went through all the names and like tried to get a definitive answer if that's who I'd come up with, but off but the top of the head. in Aotearoa? Well, he's playing for the Phoenix. He's a mm. senior contracted Phoenix player. He was on the bench for all their FFA Cup games. He's not going to be first choice or anything, but he's like 19 years old, so he shouldn't really be a first choice center back for an A-League team that's hoping to compete for a championship but he's certainly someone who can step in whenever they need him because he did that down the stretch of last season. And I thought improved heaps, like really showed a, a, a fair bit of, um, I don't know, when I'd seen him play for the for the Weenix earlier, he, he always looked like a really talented defender, but he also was someone who would like get red cards and score home goals, like multiples of them. Um, he had big mistakes in him sort of thing. He He really seemed to iron out a lot of that at the higher level, which only means like you take that away there's nothing holding you back from just like the pure potential that was also on display in those um previous national league games and in, in earlier incarnations so i don't know he's one dude um there's a few at that Phoenix, like that that under 19 team that's at the oceania champs is like at least 50 percent wellington phoenix players from that from that academy um I'm sure there's plenty of other guys who will stand up over the season from other clubs as well, but um, definitely, I mean, the Wellington Phoenix have a team in the national, in the men's national league. Like those guys will be going from the under 19s, coming back, playing a bunch of games for, um, for the Wee against these other, against, you know, Wellington Olympic and Miramar Rangers and uh, Auckland city. And um, I almost said Eastern suburbs, but the Eastern suburbs aren't there. Um Auckland United and I think Western's no Birkenhead and Melville and Kashmir Tech, Christchurch United. Uh, there's someone else there I'm missing, but who cares? So half the under 19 men's team is from the Wellington Phoenix, and then the Wellington Phoenix have their own team in the National League. So that sounds like a pretty interesting, yeah. And those topic. are all the same guys, <laughs> yeah. That seems like an interesting thing to observe. Auckland City, are they in that National League? Like, that's how it works, right? Like, local yep. clubs are in the National League. So is there someone, like a young player in that Auckland City outfit? Or if it seems like that type of club, they're more interested in having the best players, which means those players are slightly older and there isn't necessarily that development process. Is that an astute observation? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> it's it's kind of how they um uh, they they don't just have slightly older players; they just straight up have the best players. <laughs> Auckland City stack. They're they're as good as they were when it was still a Premiership franchise, and every other team that was around in that era has either been broken up or doesn't exist anymore. Um, not the case for Auckland City. They do have like there is that under twenties rule about having to pick a couple in your in your team. Um, so there are a couple of youngsters and they have they have good players. But what you often see is like um, a lot of the best players in the Auckland City Academy, and there are some very, very good players that have come through Auckland City's ranks, but then you're not starting ahead of Cam Howison or Mario Illich or um, Brian DeVries or whoever. So they go play for another club when they turn 20, you know, um, once, they're, once they're not in that sort of thing. So... You get a you get a bit of that sort of spread out. I think there was a dude, um can't remember who it was, but one of the dudes who came off the bench for, for Eastern Suburbs in the Chatham Cup final was like a Auckland City Academy dude who just left to go play for Suburbs because they were going to give him more game time. Um that story is not too uncommon. But yeah, you know, there's the under 20 rule means everyone's got a, a couple of a couple of guys in their wider squad who are gonna be getting minutes throughout the season. The other side of that coin is that watching Auckland City play football, you're probably watching the best football in Aotearoa like, that you can. So apart from like an international or professional game somewhere, just what they're doing. Kiwi NRL Finals wildcard Eels versus Raiders. Sharks versus Rabbitohs are the games this weekend. Obviously, the Panthers and the Cowboys went straight through to the next round. Said Kakite to the uh, Storm and the Roosters. Just drop a rugby league note, Wildcat. 
rugby league note. Um, Is there anything from the opening uh, round of finals game, anything you saw, anything you're looking forward to, just to get us flowing here? Well, Give me a push downhill. That I, yeah, <laughs> the two games that I watched um, closely over the weekend were, well, the two that you highlighted as the best to watch from the Kiwi and our perspective there. So there was, um, what was the first one? Panthers and Eels was the Friday night game, eh? And I did say on the podcast that I thought the eel, I picked tip the eels to get the upset there. Didn't happen. Um, didn't feel like they quite played to their potential. And then it also felt like Nathan Cleary just did like a 10 out of 10 halfback performance. He was unbelievable in that game. And you're not going to beat the Panthers when he plays at that level. So uh, unlucky fellas. But the the next game, the other game that I watched very closely was Raiders Storm, and I thought that was a cracker of a finals game. Like the only thing it was missing, it was back and forth. It was like big contact. It was just um, big players stepping up and like delivering finals performances. The only thing it was missing was like the last second try to change the result, sort of thing. Like the, the winning moment right at the very end, because it the Raiders kind of iced it by the last five minutes. But I mean, Joseph Tapane's first half performance where he played all 40 minutes in that game had like 110 meters or something and a couple offloads to try assists like a middle forward at that like at that stage of the season like finals worthy performances you you can't really play better than that it was it was pretty massive from that dude like that was that was a joy to witness you know i'm, I'm glad i i'm glad i saw that it was and Statistically, this is Joseph Tarpane's best season by quite some margin. I think he's been previously, last few years, he's averaged 130 odd meters per game, and he's gone up to 166 meters per game, which obviously brings in being first for post contact meters and those t type of things. But he's also capable of playing a lot of minutes. I think his first stint was actually 50 minutes. So he played the first yeah. 50 minutes, and then he came back later on um for like 18 minutes he's played a few 60 a few games over 60 minutes this season which is i remember them saying on the commentary his average was 51 the average per, obviously you're gonna play your best players a little bit longer than average in a, in a finals game um saw that with tom Alolo in the cowboys game didn't we but that i remember them saying that because he was he was getting up towards 51 minutes and they're like he's gonna hit his average like his average for a full game in his first stint on the field, which he didn't quite, but he almost did. Yeah, he's he's fantastic, and he's he's showing offloads. I highlighted they're all passing, so he's got a little passing game. Fisher Harris got a passing game. Tamalolo, oh, like through one of the best passes you ever see on a rugby league field. Raiders this week for their game against Parramatta Eels. This is the Friday game. Obviously, this is an absolutely barn burner between the Raiders and the Eels, both have fantastic Kiwi NRL talent. Also highly impressive in that Rail Raiders win was Matthew Tomoko. Uh, he had his like flashy moment for his first try, but I in my preview, I highlight just some solid defensive stuff where um, the Raiders are defending their try line against the Storm early in that game. And like if you play the ball on the like a meter out from the try line a basic defensive idea that seems good is just to push up and try and get to the 10 meter line you'll see a lot of shit teams know who they are not to then, name names but yeah <laughs> they're not getting anywhere near that 10 meter line on the edges so as the passes go across to the edge matthew tomoko i think kotrick is his winger Elliot Whitehead on that right edge, Jamal Fogarty maybe as well. They're all together, connected, and pushing up to that 10-meter line. And that is just some solid defense because you're getting up in the opponent's face. You're all matched up. Everything's there. And Matthew Tomoko is doing his job defensively as a young player, which is really impressive. And everyone, anyone who's seen Matthew Tomoko play rugby or rugby league they know he's a powerful runner. He's been doing that. That is why he's got this gig at the Raiders. Like that's why he got recruited from Auckland Grammar First 15 and the national tournaments for league. His powerful running. 
but he's shown some maturity in his defense. And there was another effort play where he he took the fourth run as the Raiders were getting off their try line, and he's pushing out to the left, like left center kind of not center position on rugby league, but the center of the field slightly left takes a run. And then Kotrick takes the next run and they give it to Whiten massive left foot. So he just hoofs it downfield. But Tomoko, like when Whiten kicks the ball, Tomoko's in the middle of the field. And by the time Cameron Munster gets the ball as the storm fullback, Tomoko's like sprinted back to his regular spot to be the last man on, on the defensive line right as Munster goes there. I was like, that's another like solid effort from a young player who has, I think he might've played every game for the Raiders this season, which is, yeah, he's just, and for him to be stepping up in finals with Joseph Tarpane and now Corey Hadaweta Naira, Hock Younger, uh, another Hock Younger player, he's starting for the Raiders. So he came off the bench versus the Storm. He's very versatile, very good footy player. But off the bench, he gives you some tackle pass and offload, and he just rips in. And I think his energy off the bench, along with like Corey Hawes, bruh, and Emery Gula, how do we know Naira's like energy just aligns with that? But now he's starting. So I'm curious how that looks um, just with him starting and what impact he can have because Adam Elliott is out injured. They're taking on the Eels. You mentioned Nathan Cleary. I was curious to see that every week Maratini Akori is named on the bench. For the last four games, he has started at lock. And I'm pretty sure all four of those games, he is named on the bench on Tuesday. Again, the fact that Maratini Akori played center for the Aotearoa Kiwis and now he is starting at lock is fairly bonkers. <clears throat> but it is what it is. He starts and Ryan Madison is usually named at lock, but he comes off the bench. Ryan Madison's really physical, but he's got the offload. He's got the skills. Like he is someone I expect to see throw a 30 meter spiral pass. That's his game. Near Corey is all physical. He's a monster. He's aggressive. He's got a lot of intent. He's starting to set that tone, but they're what like, um, Cooper Cronk's highlighted like there's no kick pressure on Nathan Cleary. Didn't get touched for his t first two or three kicks. That's kind of near ne Corey's job. Like he's starting, he's got that role to be physical and aggro and put pressure on Nathan Cleary, but it didn't happen. And that was part of an Eels performance where I think Dylan Brown had 50 odd run meters. Isaiah Papali'i like average six run meet, uh, meters per run and didn't have many tackle bus. So it's, it, it's like that black cap stuff wildcard. It's like Neil Corey was slightly off in executing his role, but he did so where other players were below their par. So when that's happening, you're like, oh, the eels are kind of off. And you can see that trend. Everything's in alignment with that trend. That's why they lost. That's why they looked a bit, bit off against the Panthers. And I think the running game of Brown and Papali is really important because you think Brown's on the left edge, Papali's on the right edge, Brown's got Sean Lane with him, um, Papali has got Penasini outside him, he's really classy, he's got Mitchell Moses on his side as well. Brown averages over 100 run meters per game, and Papali averages three tackle busts per game. If they're doing that on either edge, you're kind of just like poking your hole through there, poking through there, then Sean Lane's poking through over there. It's kind of everywhere. Then you're getting offloads, then you're getting quick play the balls, then you're getting short passing through the middle, then Reed Marnie's coming out, he's kicking, he's doing everything. It it seems quite simple when you think about, about it like that. Like all Dylan Brown needs to do is average is get a hundred run meters and everything else is happening with that Papali'i's job is to bust tackles he's a nugget that's what he's good at that's what he does but none of that was there for the eels against the panthers and 
Love the pe- love the Eels all season. I've loved them for a couple of seasons. Their Kiwi NRL development is exceptional. But this Raiders wave wildcard is uh, it's irresistible. Yeah, well, you turn over the storm and you've got a fair bit of confidence. Even though the storm, you know, the storm themselves, not a golden season from them. Like they had a few hiccups, certainly at one point with a few injuries. But even aside from that, it didn't feel like they were sort of like the untouchable um, top two or three type uh, title contenders that they that they have been for so long in the in the past. It did feel like maybe. I don't know. Maybe there's a there's a, definitely a changing of the guard going on with the storm at the moment because a few of the, especially a few of their major Kiwi dudes leaving. Um, maybe not the worst time for a little bit of a refresher for the storm anyway. But uh, yeah, Raiders were so good in that game that was, and the the point you made about the Eels and also the Black Caps was sort of got me thinking like, if you're a player in a team like that and you deliver a 6 out of 10 performance, if you deliver a 6 out of 10 performance in which two or three other guys in your team give 8 out of 10 performances, then a 6 out of 10 performance is exactly what it takes to help your team win. Like, if you deliver a 6 out of 10 performance in a, in a game where everybody else in your team also only gives a 6 out of 10 performance, that's kind of what happened to the Black Caps or six out of 10 or worse <laughs> and then the Black Caps thing. It's kind of what happened to them. And I think you're probably right. And it's sort of sort of what happened to the Eels too, where it's like they just didn't, I don't know, there were the, the similar modes of defeat in, in a funny kind of way. Also, you, Sean Lane, would that be uh, Warriors legend Sean Lane? One of the illustrious Warriors signings, that one. Crikey yeah, one Jack. of the greats. <laughs> uh, not quite like Sam Tompkins level, but well, um, didn't okay. cost what Sam Tompkins t- costs. So, although Sean Lane, he's probably ended up in a better position than Raymond Faitala Mariner because that was like a swap deal at the time. Sean Lane went from mm. Bulldogs to to Warriors, and Faitala Mariner went from Warriors to Bulldogs. Highlighted Faitala Mariner like he's he. <laughs> He's been holding it down at the Bulldogs for a while. He's probably one of the, you know, he's he's up there with Josh Jackson for Bulldogs veterans, which yeah. the, the difference between them is quite stark, but that's the reality. Sean Lane's a, a winning player at the Eels, and I, and that's uh it's quite different to being at the Bulldogs. So maybe maybe short term pain for Sean Lane, long term gain. Like he had to go through the ship with the Warriors and then might have ended up with the Sea Eagles, maybe. And then goes to the mm. Eels, so. It's all because of the Warriors. The Warriors, you know, did some development work with them, really set them up for that next career leap. I would, like, the Eels, it felt like, yeah, everyone was kind of 6 out of 10. But usually Dylan Brown is 8 or 9 out of 10. Pabliti's mm. 9 out of 10. Neokore is 8 out of 10, like... That's kind of their benchmark. So, let alone Moses and Gutherson, and yeah, right. So, like, and that's the thing about this game. I think the Eels they usually bounce back. They've had losses like that before throughout the season, but they usually find a way to come out the next week with a certain vigor. And I think that's going to happen against the Ta- uh, Raiders and Tarpon and Co. Sharks versus Rabbitohs. Rabbitohs just have Cody Nakarima. Saliva Harvey and Michael Cheekham. Michael Cheekham's playing his fourth or fifth game of the season, Mount Wellington Warriors Jr. Shout out Michael Cheekham. He spent six years at the Tigers. <laughs> I don't know if that's loyalty or um, maybe a bad sign that you <laughs> didn't get a job somewhere else. I don't know, but credit to him for sticking to it because six that's... years at the Tigers, it, it's... Not everyone would make it. Well, now he's playing a finals game with the Rabbitohs. Like, you know, you, um, him and Saliva Harvey. Harvey was doing, like, Raiders are good. He was with the Raiders last season. Both of them with, are with the Rabbitohs for their first uh, season with the Rabbitohs this season. Harvey is someone I want to highlight because I reckon he is a better dummy half option than Cody Nakarima. Like, they're both on the bench. Harvey spends more time at dummy half than Cody Nakarima. 
and Havili can do the small middle forward role, which I, is really interesting because the Sharks have Dale Finucane, Cameron McInnes. Like, you need some footwork and power and, like, mobility to come up against. Like, like Cameron McInnes is the half Pakia, half Palangi version of Saliva Havili. And Havili is the Tongan version of Cameron McInnes. Brandon Smith, he's the Waiheke Island version of them all, right? Like, that's the, the style of player they are. Need to think about Havili in relation to the World Cup, though, because he's a, he's a leader of that Tongan team, which he's as much a leader as Tao Malolo, as Toki Aho, Fanua Blake, Andrew Fafita. It's often Saliva Havili who is the main man of the Sipi Tao. Sipi Tao, Sipi Tao, not quite sure which one, but... He is usually leading that, which says something. Like, we think about leading the haka, same thing with uh, what the Tongans do. So he is a leader of that team, and we think about Tonga, we don't really think they have the playmakers to be a major factor right now. But if Havili's playing finals footy, if he's in the mix and he's starting at nine for Tonga in the World Cup and he's playing 80 minutes, that's a major factor for Tonga because you think about Tonga's last, World Cup success, at the very least, they had Havili, Lolohia, Atahingano, and Will Hopawari at fullback. That's a decent spine, and it's far better than the spine they had at Mount Smart Stadium against the Aotearoa Kiwis, where they could barely kick. They faced the Sharks, and Sharks are coming off that epic game against the Cowboys. Britain Nakora played 93 minutes on an edge. Mulatalo and the backs, they all played 93 minutes as well, but uh, Britton Nakora, that was a monster effort. He only had six runs for 60 meters, efficient, but not much, but he made five, 55 tackles. So he was busy. Hamlin Uele only, only played 24 minutes, and I think that game skewed to, more towards Cameron McInnes and smaller mobile forwards. So I'm interested to see what happens with Hamlin Uele because he had 10 runs for 100 meters, 10 meters per run. He was effective in his role. I'm just curious after that 93 minute game where a lot of other forwards played big minutes, if that leads to, and coming up against the Rabbitohs, they're slightly bigger, more powerful forward back. Maybe that Hamlin Uele, Andrew Fafita type of player up the middle, get a few more minutes. Yeah, and you probably want to score a few early tries if that's if you're going to be carrying a bit of fatigue um, into that one. You probably want to get out in front nice and early and not leave the work to do in the the back end. Um, the other point to make is you you're talking a little bit about World Cup stuff. How you how you feeling about because last week there was a bit like one of the things you mentioned was like Joey Manu being the absolute man and a monster who can work his way back from injury maybe if the Brewsters go a little bit deeper in the playoffs they didn't they are now out um bottom line is that probably a good thing though for the Kiwis uh World Cup preparation that he doesn't have to rush back and he can just like take his time make sure he's good for for the start of that one damn Skippy it's fantastic um <laughs> the there's also some discussion around White Air Hargraves at the moment because he's got an injury suspension that's um, doing the rounds on the news. It's interesting to see how that stuff is assessed because, like, I find this interesting with International Rugby League. No one seems to think about, like, leaders. It's mm. always just an all-star team, right? But Australia Kangaroos, they need certified Kangaroos leadership. Tonga. You need Taumalolo, Fanua Blake, Tokiaho, Havili, Andrew Fafita. You need them for leadership and to tell the young players, like, this is what we're up to. Samoa doesn't really have that, hence they, they struggle. Kiwis, you need Jesse Bromwich. You need Wairea Hargreaves. Like, they are the epitome of Aotearoa mana. It's not like you just select <clears throat> an all-star team, you show up, you play footy. No, you need to be like ingrained in Aotearoa Kiwis Rugby League. That is the difference from now compared to like that 2017 uh, era. So like 
Wadea Hargreaves has immense value just being in the squad. Same with Jesse Bromwich. As we saw against Tonga, the Kiwis do not necessarily need Wadea Hargreaves playing. They might not even need Jesse Bromwich playing. I think they should have one of them playing. Like I think one of them is certified top 17. But when you think about their roles on the field, like Moses Liotta's does a decent job off the off the bench. Britton Nakora played off the bench for the Kiwis against Tonga. Um, so those are the kind of the spots for Wadea Hargreaves in the team. But that is to say, Aotearoa Kiwis have options. Like <laughs> you, you might want to rest Fisher Harris for this game. Then you play Wadea Hargreaves. You might want to. Yeah, Tarpane's gone all the way to the grand final, so you don't need to play the first couple of games, bro. Like. Go to the pub in England. It's all good. Like, we're on tour. Have a bit of fun. Enjoy the Kiwis culture, the vibe, and international travel. Go see the Queen's grave, yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> go dish out some, some flowers. flowers down. <laughs> yeah, like, it's all good. We do not need, like, even if you lose Joey Manu, you can piece together something and still be competitive, right? Like, even if you lose Dylan Brown, you can put Kieran Foran in. It's yeah. There's a there's tears to these players, but Aotearoa Kiwis have depth. They have options. They have versatility, and this is the biggest thing I'm pondering. You you can't really make a Kiwis squad playing for a bottom eight team, and you're not going to play for a Kiwis squad just because you're on the bench for your NRL team. To be in a Kiwis squad and a Kiwis team. You need to be one of the best NRL players every week. And that's the difference. Whereas before it was like, oh, this guy's available. This guy's changed eligibility. So he's here. He wants to play for us. And he's playing reserve grade. So you're in, son. No, now it's like, are you better than White A. Hargreaves? Because not, not many blokes are. But there's some forwards for the Kiwis who are. And they're going to, that's the selection ranks. So it's a, uh, Aotearoa sport in summary yeah that bit about like you can't be a good team without having those kind of leaders it's exactly why Winston Reid gets picked for the always even when he's not necessarily fit to play like it's the same thing you have to have those guys in your squad to be successful Māori order raise your mana stay beautiful kia kaha we'll be back Next week with more podcasts. Stay tuned for the email banger tomorrow and tune in the website, thenish-case.com. Chit-chit.